New Japan Pro Wrestling just had their biggest show of the year at the very beginning of the year, their annual Wrestle Kingdom show. We just got off of it. I am here to cover both of these shows. It's not very often I get a chance to cover one show as part of the podcast, but I figure rather than separate them, I'll talk about them both here. Uh, night one, eee. night two, yay! It, it was almost like night and day, in my opinion. But we'll talk about that a lot more, as well as some of your questions and my predictions for the year 2021. This is the 28th edition of the Chill Spill Podcast. The yes, is silent, by the way. Yo, what is going on, guys? It is your boy, Tyler Mask, a.k.a. Tyler Coon Williams, a.k.a. Tyler Suplex, a.k.a. The One Who Lived. And welcome back to the 28th edition of the Chill Spill Podcast. And that is Pill, spelled with an S, but it's silent, much like all the Tetsuya Naito and Jay White fans were after the results of Wrestle Kingdom 15. But we'll talk about that in just a little bit. Guys, this is the very first Chill Spill podcast of 2021, and what a great way to bring in a new year than with some of the best wrestling on the planet, New Japan Pro Wrestling, bringing us Wrestle Kingdom, some of the best, one of the best shows of the year. Happens at the very beginning of each year, but it normally always ends up being the best show of the year. They always put their best foot forward for their shows, and it's always a treat. It's always a treat. I think this year, more than other years, I would say it's been some of the worst build. I can't honestly sit here and say this was a bad Wrestle Kingdom because it was not bad at all. I probably would say in the line of Wrestle Kingdoms I've seen, this is probably somewhere in the in the center. Not in the, not in the, not in the back, not in the back, but probably in the center. It's nowhere. It's not. It's not near the top. Like. Okay, if I had to rank the Wrestle Kingdoms like 11, okay, let me start from 9. If I had to go from like 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I'm not going to sit here and rank them all in order. But like from 9 to 15, 15 would probably be somewhere in the middle. Like that's where I would put this show. It wasn't, like if we're talking about like the Knights individually, I thought Night 1 was definitely the uh, inferior Knights. It just had a lot less good going for it. Night 2 definitely dominated. Night 2 is where a lot of the action was at. We'll break down each night uh, and all the action that happened in it and what I think will be happening going forward. But uh, one more time, before we get into that, let me give a quick little plug to our Patreon backers, Mason Goldberg and JPW Fan 10 and Liam Version 1. Thank you guys so much for being Patreon backers. You guys are listening to this very, the, you're the very first listeners here. Uh, this is going up pretty late on Wednesday. Normally I get this up on Wednesday morning, but... I've been very busy today. You know, I woke up very early in the morning for the Wrestle Kingdom live stream. Then after that ended, I was working on videos all day. And that's the thing about being a content creator. You're always working. And then by the time I finished that, then I was starting to uh, pack up. Then I got busy again. And now here I am, 9 o'clock at night, doing this. And then I have to finish packing. I have to finish doing it. It's been a very busy day. So I'm actually kind of glad I'm going on my trip tomorrow because I had to get to get some rest. <laughs> Because I tell you, man, I was looking back at my live streams and I literally streamed 10 hours of content. 10 hours of content in the last two days. And it's only been two streams. Ridiculous. I know there's streamers out there that do 24 hour streams. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it, honestly. I, 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 I can keep my interest on professional wrestling for so long. I could never do a 24 hour stream. I don't know. I don't know. And you'd think I'd probably be able to do it because I stream so often, but it's, I don't know, man, it sounds too long. But, me out the way. Let's talk about Wrestle Kingdom 15, New Japan Pro Wrestling. I said it earlier, the build-up to the show wasn't really all that good leading into what we saw here. But, I will say that it wasn't bad at all. Now, what was bad, <laughs> what was bad was the opening match of Wrestle Kingdom Night 1. I guess technically this isn't the opening match. We'll start off with Night 1. This wasn't the opening match. Technically it was the pre-show. But 
I still like to think of it as the opening match. So let's talk about it. Pre-show night one, we had the New Japan Rambo. Not the Rumble. They renamed it the Rambo. So in this match, you had some guys coming in. The likes of Ishii, the likes of Goto. Basically, anybody who is not on the main show is on this card. Which I think is just kind of shitty. It reminds me of the WrestleMania Battle Royals. Like, we couldn't get you on a main card. But here you go. You got a, you got a, you got a spot on the card. You're actually going to be in the arena. Just not important enough to be on the main show. So... But I guess for them, it's best to be on a show in some capacity to not be on a show at all. So, yeah, I, guess, I guess that's one way to look at it. Got to look at the brighter side of things, right? So, you had all those guys come in here. Uh, Chase Owens is one of the first guys, and he made it to the end. Uh, Bad Luck Fale also made it towards the end. Bushi made it towards the end as well. And final guy, because remember, guys, the final four would meet in the basically the finals, in a sense on night two in a fatal four match where the winner will be the KOPW 2021 professional champion I believe either way the last guy to be in this match was Toriano you cycle through a bunch of these guys Toriano starts making his way down to the ring now mind you Chase I think Bad Luck Fly has already thrown somebody out so now it is just Bushi who Bushi's already been outside the Bushi was outside the ring for like 20 minutes of this match which I thought was ridiculous so Bushi slides in the ring. Chase Owens and Folly are already in the ring. So now you just, it's just <laughs> Yano looking in the ring like, wait a minute, hold on. There's three guys in the ring? It's, that's four people. So the referee's looking around like, wait a minute, wait a minute. We got all the guys we need. And then he calls for the bell, and I'm like, so you mean to tell me Toriano never entered in the match officially, but he's going into the next match. And I said something along those lines on the stream like, I don't remember quote for quote what I said, but I remember saying something exactly similar. Like, what if somebody, like, somebody can come in last and they're more than likely to make it to the finals because they're the last draw, which I always thought that was kind of unfair because you're doing a final four scenario, not a final one or a final two. It's the final four. And that's exactly what happened to Toriano, but good for him. So Chase Owens, Bushi, Bad Luck, Fale, Toriano make it on. Uh, The match was a cluster. It was just a complete, utter, all over the place New Japan does not know how to do rumbles or battle royals. Good thing to do once a year because if they did it any other time, it would not work out very well for them. But then we hop into the main show. So the first match we had on Wrestle Kingdom Night 1 was Hiromu Takahashi versus El Fantasma. uh, The BOSJ winner Hiromu versus the uh, Super J Cup winner ELPP. And the winner of this match will be challenging Taiji Ishimori for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. On night two. Alright. So I thought this match was... I thought this was like... And I really hate to not say... It was, I really want to say this match is good. Like I so desperately want to say this is a good match. Because Hiromu's in here. And Hiromu's always in like great great matches. And it's Wrestle Kingdom. So obviously they're going to show out here. El Phantasmo. I don't not like him. Like I don't, I don't have a distaste for him. But he does nothing for me. Like, I've I've not seen a great El Fantasma match since his match with Rocky Romero at BOSJ26, like, two years ago. I have not seen a great match of his since then. And you could say even then, a lot of that match is Rocky Romero. Because you go back to Rocky Romero versus Will Ospreay, a lot of that match is Rocky too. But, <laughs> Rocky too. Anyway. El Fantasma come out here. He was healing it up. He was doing all the BS. You know El Fantasma does. He's flipping off the crowd. He's doing his little, uh, not, this dude was paying homage to, like, every wrestler under the sun. He came out with, like, these edge-like tights. He was doing the, um, these mannerisms, like, all the other heel wrestlers. Like, he was basically blending together a bunch of wrestlers in his moveset, which, you know, I ain't gonna lie. I think that's kind of funny, kind of cool at the same time. Paying his homage to the late great Undertaker. I don't know why I said late great. To the Undertaker with his uh, <laughs> tightrope walk that he always does. Doing the uh, he, I love how he does the Ric Flair tightrope walk. Like he does the Ric Flair strut while he's doing the Undertaker walk on the tightrope. That's pretty cool. Um, I don't know what it was about those two in this match. I thought the chemistry just was not there. I mean, there were times in here where it picked up a little bit. And they were doing some things here and there. But... The match went like 17 minutes, and I felt like as soon as it started picking up, it just kind of ended. It was just kind of abrupt, and I'm like, oh, all right. Yeah, uh, Hiromu Takashi put down El Fantasma with the Dynamite Plunger and got the pin. So Hiromu making it on to night two to face Taiji Shimori. Like I said, I thought this match was, it was, 
it was aggressively decent. Like, if I had to give this match my rating out of 10, which I tend to do out of 10 ratings just to make it, you know, more appeasing to others because I ain't gonna lie, the whole rating system I don't really care for. If I had to give it a rating out of 10, I would give this a 6 and a half. I guess I'll be nice to give it a 6 and a half. I feel like giving it a 6 would be a disservice. I'll give it a 6 and a half out of 10 because they actually did some work in here. It just felt like it never picked up for me personally. But then we get into the next match, Taichi and Zack Sabre Jr. versus Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa for the IWGP Heavyweight Tag Team Championships. Now, a lot of people like myself had doubts going into this match because you have two heel tag teams and Girls of Destiny and the Dangerous Techers. So how exactly do you pace or structure a match like this where Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa always have, you know, Jot on their side with the kendo sticks, smacking backs, you know, trying to uh, get the upper hand for those guys or healing it up zsj and taichi they really don't cheat as much well i could definitely say they don't cheat as much as girls of destiny do and if they do cheat it's not as in your face about it you know it's it's it, i won't say it's subtle but it's not as always it's not always loud and it's not always you know as frequent so Going into it, like, as soon as the bell rung, I'm sitting here like, well, we've seen glimpses of, like, Zack Sabre Jr. doing babyface, like, stuff. Maybe it'll be, like, Titan ZSJ. And as I guessed, it was Titan ZSJ kind of really having that babyface role in a sense. And not even more so Taichi. It was Zack Sabre Jr. Like, there's one hot tag in here that I really liked where Taichi made the hot tag. And Zack Sabre Jr. came in, and he's just going after Tonga Loa and Tama Tonga one by one by himself. And he's locking these submissions, and... I ain't gonna lie, like, when we had some, like, tag action in here, I thought they messed very well together. I feel like I'm one of the, excuse me, I feel like I'm one of the very few people who actually like this match a lot. Like, I thought this was a very good tag team match. It had a lot of good tag action from both teams. It was paced pretty well. I did feel like at times it could have been a bit clunky, but that's, that's, that could be every match. I just felt like there's a lot you could take in here. It was easy to grasp. Um... It, I was not really super big on the outcome. I did see it coming, but wasn't super big on it. Uh, Tonga Loa did end up hitting his assisted middle power bomb onto Taichi with the help of Tonga Matanga, of course, and got the pin over Taichi and Zack Sabre Jr. to become the new and now seven time IWGP heavyweight tag team champions. Now, the only reason why I say I'm not really a big fan of this outcome is because Girls of Destiny. They've been in New Japan for like, what, going on five years now? Since like 2016, maybe a bit earlier than that for Tama Tonga? They've been in New Japan for quite a while. Seven times as tag team champions. One of the things they've been wanting to do for the longest time, one of their missions and goals in New Japan, was to win World Tag League, which they just did last year, and was to go into the Tokyo Dome with the World Tag League, you know, trophies, and win in the Tokyo Dome. Because, uh, unless I'm wrong here, and I probably am wrong, G.O.D., did they ever win the Tokyo Dome? Like, I don't think they ever won the belt in the Tokyo Dome before. Might be wrong once again. But they kind of had, like, two things they wanted to accomplish. And within a month, they accomplished both of those things. So, you kind of look at them as a team, and you're like, well, what's left for them, you know? They faced every tag team you could ever think of in New Japan. They've been in, like, what, three different World Tag Leagues. So every tag team combination they've already faced. They've been seven-time tag, which is probably the most reigns ever in New Japan. Seven-time tag team champions. What else do you do with them? I don't think there's really a thing for them to do. Outside of just keep on doing what they're doing, which is much of the same. I feel like they had a goal. They achieved the goal. Now they're just going to float. Which kind of sucks to think about it, but unless you're going to have Tama Tonga and Tonga Loa break apart for a little bit, and I'm not saying like turn, that the, the, not every breakup has to be a turn. Maybe you have them like going to singles run. Tama Tonga, I think he tried to do a little singles run in 2018 when he was at a G1 Climax, but then he just kind of stopped. Like maybe Tama Tonga should go into singles run for a little bit. Tonga Loa can do the same. You know, I feel like maybe after this, just, just see what goes, just see what happens. They can always reunite. There's nothing wrong with that. I would even have them break up. Maybe just have them mutually say, hey, let's do let's do our thing for a little bit. See what happens. 
I mean, Jay Uso's doing this thing in WWE right now. I understand that Jimmy Uso got hurt, but he's doing this thing. He's doing pretty fine. I think to ta- the same core for Tama Tonga and Tonga Oa. But that's after they lose the tag team titles. Who they lose it to, I, I have no idea. Like I said, I thought this was a pretty good match. I would pro- I would give this a 7. I would give this a 7. I thought this is better than the last match. We then get into the next match. Kenta versus Satoshi Kojima for the IWGP United States Championship Challenge. Right? Yeah, yeah you thought I was going to say the championship. No, of course not. They would never. Never. The challenge rights. Now, before this match actually started, we got a VTR promo message from who else but the champion himself, John Moxley. He was not in the arena. He was not backstage. He was at the sets of NJPW Strong. He had his hoodie on. He had the belt in his arm, around his shoulder. And he's talking about how I'm coming after the winner of this match. He, and what killed me is that he said, I don't know when, I don't know where, but I'm coming for you. And I'm like, so let me get this straight. This is your first appearance. First, not as, not as like first, like, you know, match or anything. His first appearance on New Japan television since February. And you're here to tell us that you plan to fight the winner but you don't know when. So basically, you're just going to hold on. You're going to have a stranglehold on that championship for a long. That's what I got out of this promo. You are not dropping it. You're going to keep a stranglehold on it. So I, I ain't going to lie. I wasn't happy. Saw people hype like, oh my God, John Moxie's back. John Moxie's back. I'm like, bitch, he literally just told you he's not coming there yet. Like, what y'all getting hyped for? So Kenta, this dude's a big goof. He's holding a briefcase for no reason. I mean, obviously he's holding it for a reason, but you... It's like you still don't know. He's, we still don't know. Obviously, he can't give a date. I understand that because the borders are closed off. He couldn't come to Japan. And nobody from Japan can go to America. So if Kenta is in Japan, obviously, that match doesn't happen until the borders open back up. And nobody knows when that is. So to an extent, I understand. But also, they had many months to strip John Moxley of the U.S. Championship. And they have not done it. And now they're doubling down by saying that he's keeping it until he can defend it. So at this point, I'm tired of talking about it. I am so tired of just saying to drop the title because obviously they're not going to. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna proceed on. I'm proceeding on. Whatever. I I, I literally don't give a fuck about the championship anymore. Whatever. Uh, the match itself, I thought was it was it was it was good for what it was. It was Kenta and Kojima. You know, just hard strikes, kicks from Kenta. Kojima titty chops that you guys expect to happen was in here. It was nothing overly impressive. Joseph Matsusila loved the hell out of this match, but he's a contrarian, so he loves anything that you I don't like, and vice versa. <laughs> but anyway, uh, like I said, the match didn't go too long. Uh, I don't remember too much outside of Kent really hitting a DTS and pinning Kojima. Like that's really how uneventful the match was, in my opinion, at least. Like I said, pretty decent from what I remember, but nothing else special really happened. Um, I would give this a six, mm, six and a half, high six and a half though. I think it was definitely better than the opener, but not by much. High six and a half, if that's even a thing. So then we get into the next match. Hiroshi Tanahashi versus the Great Okan. Now this match right here, this is a match I was not enthused about at all when I first heard about it. I said as much on Twitter, and everybody's like, oh, you gotta get the Great Okan a chance. Oh, Tanahashi's not being buried. You're just over-exaggerating. And I was over-exaggerating. I ain't gonna lie. I was, I was just playing it up. But at the same time, there was nothing about this match to scream, this is gonna be a Wrestle Kingdom worthy match. This is gonna be a great match that I can't miss. And what do you know? It wasn't a great match. It wasn't even a good match. I thought, outside of... Now, I'll give, I'll give them both credit. Of course, I'm going to give Con- Tanashi credit. He's a fucking goat. I'll give Okan credit. I thought the opening sequence, the opening few minutes of mat work, I thought it was he was actually pretty good on the mat. Like all the lockups and catch holds, I thought he was actually fairly good at it. As soon as he got up to his feet, that's when he became a snort fest. Like, he's good on the mat, but just don't let him get up. Just, it, it just... The Great Okan does nothing for me either. I'm sorry. I'm not going to sit here and say the guy's terrible because I don't think he's bad. 
I just feel like he's green and there's not much to him. Um, I will say it was the best match I've seen him in, but that's literally not saying much. He aimed at Tanashi's leg, which everybody aims at Tanashi's leg. This is nothing new. Tanashi made his comeback. He had his high fly flows, and then he got the pin over the Great Okan. So that was the match. I would give this a five. Five for effort. Five for effort. Uh, Tanashi won this match, and that really... I, I expected Tanashi to win. And I feel like they kind of backed themselves into a corner with this booking because... If you guys remember, when they were doing the promos for this match, the Great Okan was like, if you win, if we win this match, Tanashi, you're going to be our servant. You're going to be our bitch. You're going to kiss our feet and da 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 And I'm like, literally nobody for a, a, a goddamn second actually believed any of that was going to happen. Did you actually believe you're going to see Tanashi coming out here as the lap dog of Will Ospreay and the Great Okan? That was never, never going to happen. That was never going to happen. So immediately when that stipulation was said, I already knew Tanashi was winning. And it sucks because it's like the Great Okan is this new guy you're trying to get over. Even though I'm not big on him, that doesn't mean I want to see him lose. I want to see him get buried right away. You know, he's a guy you're trying to get over. He's a guy you're trying to make an opposing figure. And he loses to Tanashi. Now obviously Tanashi is, you know, an a ace, former ace, the ace, you could, whatever way you perceive him in, of Japan. So losing to him is not a bad thing. But you also got to consider this is a new faction he's a part of. The Empire trying to make an impression off these guys. They just became a faction back in October. That's That wasn't even a whole two months ago. We've been a part of the Empire. and that, Well, three months ago, I should say. We've been into the Empire. And now one of the guys who's supposed to be like the bodyguard of Will Ospreay already lost. So, huh. You get into the next match. You're like, well, the Great Okan loss must be Will Ospreay getting his vengeance back for the fallen Great Okan. He has to get the win for his faction. And that leads us into the next match, the co-main event of the evening. Kazuchika Okada versus Will Ospreay. Now, I had to watch this match back twice. On the first go, I wasn't really all that enthused about the match. Second go around, I can say I thought it was a great match. I, I'm not part of this crowd who thinks this is the greatest match of the year. This is, this was everything I ever want. I still am a firm believer, and I, I'm, I'm curious about what you guys think about this hot take I'm about to say right here. I'm a firm believer that, that their G129 match was the best match they've had. The G1 Climax 29 match was epic. I loved that match. This match was basically almost that match, but I had 15 minutes of nothing happening in the beginning. It was slower paced than the G129 match. It wasn't as flashy, which I feel like maybe uh, maybe I didn't like because it wasn't as flashy. Like it was one of the it was an Okada it was Okada, New Japan epic. That's what it was. The first 15 minutes, really nothing happened. I can give Okada credit here. He did bust out a Terminator dive in like the five minute mark, which I wasn't expecting. But outside of that, it's your typical Okada chest slap, wrist holds, neck locks. You know, taking damage from Osprey. Osprey's getting a lot of the work in. Okada's trying to sell. He's coming back. Then you get to the midsection. Then they're starting to hit some of their greatest hits. You know, they're hitting the uh, drop kicks. Osprey's hitting the hoof kicks. And the chip chip cheerios. All that good stuff. And then you get to, like, closer to the end stretch. And there's this really weird spot in here. And I say really weird because I don't understand why this even happened. So, at one point, you have Okada and Osprey to do in the strike battle. Because it has to happen in an epic. Otherwise, it's not in New Japan. They have in their strike battle, you know. Osprey does an elbow. Yay! Uh, Okada does an elbow. Boo! Osprey does an elbow. Yay! Okada does an elbow. Boo! And they're exchanging, exchanging. And Okada starts getting the upper hand on him. And Osprey's trying to fight back. And Okada is beating this guy down. It's not like a bushy, you know, Super Saiyan level beat down. But... He's beating Osprey down, and now you have Osprey on the mat, and Okada is standing over him. And New Japan, they're really great at doing these, like, they're really great at videography. Like, New Japan, if you're looking for, like, some of the best shots and for as far as camera work and professional wrestling, New Japan and Stardom are where it's at. Like, WWE has all the tools and all the, uh, 
all the resources to craft together what New Japan does, but they just don't. They're too focused on shaky KMs and trying to do all the zoom-ins and shit. However, New Japan really great at trying to capture the moment and really tell stories by what you're perceiving, not more so what they're telling you. And what I perceived here is that Okada is beating an Osprey. You see Okada is standing over Osprey, who's struggling up to his feet. And it took me, it, it kind of threw me off because it's like that kind of spot, that kind of sequence, that kind of imagery, you're normally reserved for the heel beating down the babyface. Or the babyface is now making a comeback. And it's like a snarky heel who deserves it, you know? And I guess you could say the same for Osprey. But once again, Osprey is the leader of the Empire. The Empire that is a new faction that you're trying to establish. And here you are with Okada standing over top of Osprey, who's struggling to get up to his feet. And every time he does get up to his feet, he's knocked back down by Okada, who stands over him and at one point even smiles and kind of laughs a little bit. Almost like, <laughs> you peasant, how dare you think you could beat me? It's, it's just like, are you serious? Like, it's stuff like that that just, like, makes me just roll my eyes. Like, you guys couldn't have even get, let Osprey... Like, if the worlds were reversed, that would have been a lot better. It would have been predictable because that's what that's what Okada is in every fucking epic that he's in. But, you know, it would have been a better shot. You could use that for VTR. But Osprey on the ground gonna beat down? That wasn't... No, that was not, that was not ideal at all. I did not like that. And I'm not even an Osprey fan. But you get a bit deeper into the match. They're going at that 30-minute mark. Now all the greatest hits are coming in. Okada's doing the drop kick. He's doing a Rainmaker pose. All the counter sequences are coming in. It's starting to kick up. This is the part where everybody's like, oh, six, seven stars. And I'm like, all right, all right, all right, all right. It's great and all, but calm down. So I did like the spot where Osprey uh, counters Okada's Rainmaker and hits a tombstone of his own, which... I, I thought Okada, I thought Osprey's tombstone was kind of jank because like he he leapt into the air, but when he was coming down, he started tilting his body forward, so it looked like he just kind of slammed Okada on the ground rather than do a tombstone. But I bought into it, whatever. He got him up, and hit a rainmaker, and I'm like, it's not the end of the match, but that was cool. I like that. I like that. So he doesn't get the pin. Okada gets up to his feet. They're trying to battle it out. Osprey's hitting his rolling elbow. Uh, Osprey was trying to do rolling elbow city in this match. He had like four or five of these goddamn things. And I'm like, bruh, I get it. Just hit your goddamn him bl hidden blade and go home. So then he sets up for the hidden blade, but Okada catches him. And Okada, for like four different attempts, is locking in this money clip. Can somebody please tell Okada that nobody, and I'm not talking about just American fans, not the Japanese fans, not the American fans, not the Saudi Arabian fans, not the Chinese fans, not the Antarctic fans, not the African fans. Nobody in the planet likes the money clip. It's it's not interesting at all. It 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 just it, it sucks the life out of the match. He does like Okada does not realize that when he sets this move up, it's slow, it's plotting, and when he applies it. He's not very good at making it feel impactful. It just it just drains the match in a sense. And when you do it multiple times, it doesn't add much more. I mean, the final time, yes. But I'm not cheering for you, so that's not doing anything for me. And the people who are cheering for you, they don't even like the move either. So I don't know if Okada is just deaf or what, but I need him to I need him to quit it. Nobody's buying into it anymore. So anyway, he locks in the money clip, Osprey gets out of it, he locks in it again, Osprey this time goes behind him, tries for, I believe, the uh, the Stormbreaker, Okada gets out of it, they exchange it, Okada hits the Twisting Rainmaker, everybody's creaming their pants like, oh my god, Okada, he hit the Tombstone, and Okada does hit the Rainmaker and wins the match with it, and everybody just, you know lost all bodily fluid that Okada actually finished off a match at the Rainmaker. Such perfect storytelling, New Japan. Oh my god, yes. Yes, Okada actually ended the match with the Rainmaker. Now, let's end this whole idea that this is part of the plan. It was not part of the plan. He literally has hit the Rainmaker in every fucking match he's been in since <laughs> New Japan came back. Let's just end it right there. But, Okada did win the match. I thought the match is great. I would give it a... 
I'll give it a... Do I give it an 8? Or a 7 and a half? I'll give it an 8. I thought, I'll give it an 8. I'll give it an 8. But here's my thing about this match that I really didn't like. In a previous match, you had the Great Okan lose to Tanahashi. And like I said, Tanahashi is the ace. Great Okan is new. I can understand that. Well, Osprey is the leader. He's not new to New Japan. Osprey been in New Japan for like 5 years now. He's not a young lion. He's not even he's not even the underling of Okada anymore. This is this is his equal now. If you're a faction leader, you are equal to other faction leaders. He's supposed to be on the same level as Okada. But here he is losing to Okada in the in the Tokyo Dome Coming events. What does this do for Osprey exactly? It doesn't do anything for him. Not at all. And you could say, oh, well, he had a great match. At no, he lost. Just just, just keep it at that. Osprey is a loser, and the Great Okan is a loser as well. So now, the only hope is for Jeff Cobb to win a night two. And we'll talk about that when we get to night two. And that leads us into the main event of the evening. Tetsuya Naito versus Kota Ibushi for the IWGP Intercontinental and Heavyweight Championship. I thought this was a great match. But it was not a Wrestle Kingdom main event level of great. Like, it's weird because I literally had to watch this match back again because, like, I did not get a full grasp as to what I watched the first time. Like, I knew I was watching Naito and Ibushi in the Tokyo Dome main event. And I knew what I was getting into. And I did get what I expected, which was them taking dead, dangerous neck spots. 90% of it was Naito. Naito took a lot of those dangerous neck spots. Now, Abushi did take, like, probably the most damning of them all. Taking a back suplex on the apron where he landed on his goddamn neck. But Naito, he was laying on his neck for a lot of this match. There was also one really cool, uh, the, the, the first death, you know, that Naito hit on Abushi. Abushi sold that, like, death. He literally landed on his neck and head and just landed. Ugh. Ugh. It was, it was grody. It was grotesque, the way he landed. But outside of that, the match itself, like I said, it was great for what it was. I've seen like four, night, four or five Naito Bushi matches at this point. They've had nine or ten matches, and I've seen half of them. And I can honestly say that this, I don't even know if this is this is my favorite match of theirs. I still, I'm still a big fan of the G1, um, G1 24 match they had. I would even say the um, New Japan Cup 2019 match they had. Nah, no, nah, I would put this over New Japan Cup 2019. I still think that their G1 24 match is better than this one. And this was a Tokyo Domain event. That's not to say it wasn't bad, of course. But I don't want to go through paint by numbers every single thing that happened. If you guys did not tell by, if you guys cannot tell by now, I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to tell you guys what I thought about the match, what I liked about the match. I thought it was well paced. Uh, the very beginning. It was, like, kind of slow, which is odd because it's like Naito is not the type of guy to set the tone for Max, but he was working over uh, Bushi's neck with these holds and whatnot. And that opening stretch was odd. Like, it just, it, 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 it didn't work. I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be honest. It didn't work for me. I was like, in the role of Okada doing it, it worked because I expect Okada to do it. In the role of Ibushi against someone like Jay White, all right. But, like, when it's Ibushi and naito against each other trying to extend out the match it just doesn't it doesn't it doesn't feel right but as it progressed you got to that 20 minute mark then it got into the abushi naito match that you expect them to have all the high spots all the neck landings all that great shit and after the second kamagu then I, let me tell you here this 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 i was shocked by and i talked to joseph matsu about it and he was like yeah they buried this move so Kota Bushi hits Kamaguye, and Naito kicks out. I'm like, you know what? All right. Okada kicked out of the Kamaguye last year's G1 Climax, so it's not like I'm super surprised by this. I'm almost certain G1 kicked out of the Kamaguye. I'm almost certain that uh, Evil, not even Evil, not Evil, uh, someone else kicked out of the Kamaguye. Like, people, like, three other people kicked out of the Kamaguye before. He's not the first person. So I'm like, whatever. But then, like, a minute or so later... He hits the second Kamaguye, and he kicks out again. And I'm like, wait a minute, two? He kicked out of two Kamaguyes? 
Like, I've seen one. But I think Naito might be the first guy to pick out of two of these motherfuckers. So, that threw me for a loop. And I'm like, well, I don't think... I don't think the move was buried. But I don't think I would have had him kick out of two of them. No, I was like... Yeah, I don't know about that. So, anyway... Naito's starting to get some resistance now. He's starting to come back. I think he hits a second Destino, which scared the fuck out of me, but Ibushi kicked out. So now they're battling out again, and Ibushi manages to hit a step-up V-trigger onto Naito. His knee his knee pad's down now. Hits a bare-bone Kamaguye onto Tetsuya Naito. Not a third one. Covers him for the three count. One, two, three. And just like that... Kota Ibushi is your new IWGP Intercontinental and Heavyweight Champion. Much to my excitement, delight, it was an amazing moment. I loved every second of it. You guys know me. I'm one of the biggest Kota Ibushi fans you'll find. When I first started watching New Japan, the first man I gravitated towards was Kota Ibushi. I went to the Tokyo Dome last year... Because he won the G1 Climax. And I was certain he's going to win. He's going to beat Okada. And he didn't. And then he lost to Jay White. And I'm like, what What the fuck? And now we're here. They wait until a pandemic where I can't even travel to, to Japan to see this show. To do it. So, fuck you Japan for not doing it when I was there. But I'm, I'm happy you did it. So, let me not be too ungrateful about it. Like I said, I thought this was a great match. I do think this is better than, a, than the last match. I would give this, um, see, I really badly want to say 9 out of 10, but I don't feel like it was a 9 out of 10, honestly. Like, I feel like when I when it comes down to it, I had to watch this match back twice because I really didn't know how I felt about it after watching it the first time. Like, I thought the match was great when I watched it the first time. It wasn't until, like, after the second night and I watched... Uh, Ibushi versus Jay White that I was like, well, how do I feel about Knights on Ibushi now? Like, I can't be the only one, right? Like, after Ibushi versus Knights on happened, I, I mean, Ibushi versus uh, White happened, I'm like, was was the Naito and Ibushi match as great as I remember it being? And then I was like, was the match even that great to begin with? Like, I, when I had to question it that way, I, I can't give it a nine. I gotta give it eight and a half. Some of y'all are not going to like it, but eight and a half for me. Like I said before, I don't I don't think this is a, a Tokyo Dome Wrestle Kingdom worthy main event. A, a great match. Just not not the main event. Not main event worthy in my opinion. But that was night one. Night one in my opinion was... Yeah. Yeah. I think when I was on stream, I gave it a 7 out of 10. I'll, give, I'll keep that rating. Give it a 7 out of 10. I think six and a half would probably have to constitute something else being bad about it, but nah, I think seven out of ten is pretty fair. So then from there we get into night two of Wrestle Kingdom fifteen. In this we had the fatal four way from the previous night. You had Toriano, Bad Luck Fale, Bushi, and Chase Owens fatal four way. This sucked. <laughs> This had no business being on a main card. So New Japan said, Alright, so not only are we going to have Night 1 have a pretty okay uh, opener, but we're going to have Night 2 have a worse opener. This match structurally just was not good. You had Bullet Club in here trying to be dominant. Bushi was in and out of this match. Toriano was out of this match for most of it. Only came in to do a double uh, low blow and roll somebody up. And that was it. <laughs> that was the match. It had no business. Be you could have you could have put any other match in this slot, and it would have been better than this match. Honest to God, honest to God. I would give it a solid three and a half out of ten, and I'll leave it at that. But then we get into the next match: Yoshinobu Kanemaru and El Desperado versus Master Wado and Ryusuke Taguchi. For the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships. I like this match. I liked it. I liked it. I thought it was really good. Um, what I, How do I compare it to the Heavyweight Tag Team match? I I think I might give the edge slightly to the Heavyweight Tag. And I, it's, a, it's like a, by an inch. It's like by an inch. This is also really good. 
I thought everybody had really good interactions in here. Ryusuke Taguchi, he uh, he was really good in this match as the comedy character. Master Wado has been improving a lot. Desperado, he's always great at what he does. Connie Morrow, he's really good in here as well. Uh, the the deep interactions that we had in here that I really liked were uh, Connie Morrow and Wado. They have really good chemistry in their singles match at um, New Japan Cup. And I feel like in here they had a lot of good chemistry as well. Desperado and Wado have really good chemistry. Uh, Ryusuke Taguchi, I... <laughs> He's Taguchi, man. I'm never crazy about Taguchi, but he was good in this match. Not going to run down all the spots, but El Desperado did end up putting down Master Wado with the Pinche de Loco for the win in order to retain... The IWGP Junior Heavyweight Tag Team Championships, I would give this a seven? Six and a half. Six and a seven. Like a seven. Seven's kind of high. No, it's not. Seven's not. Ah, seven. I want to give it a seven. I think this match is worthy of a seven. Six and a half. See, now I don't want to. I don't want to be a fucking. Uh, I don't want to be a in between and be like, oh, I'm gonna give it six and three quarters. Like, no, it's either six and a half or it's a seven. I'm gonna stick with a six and a half. Six and a half for me. But then we get to the next match. Oh, man, this match right here, boy. Shingo Takaki versus Jeff Cobb for the Never Open Way Championship. This match had no reason to slap this hard, but it did. We've seen Jeff Cobb and Shingo have matches in the past. G129, G130, you name it. Their matches were good. This one is like kicked up to like 100. These two went at each other with so much more vigilance, so much more velocity. It was faster. It was hard hitting. These two were powering each other. I mean, Jeff Cobb, I know how strong he is. I've seen this guy in Blue Underground as Matanza Cueto. I've seen this guy launch Ishii into outer space in a G1 Climax 30. But this dude was in here flinging Shingo around like he was nothing. And Shingo, to his credit, wasn't even taking that shit. Like, Shingo was in here. If if Jeff Cobb threw him, guess what? Shingo came back even harder. And at times, Shingo was trying to throw Cobb around. Now, he wasn't throwing him around. He was more so powering him up. But Shingo wasn't having that. And, like, Shingo was doing suicide dives. Jeff Cobb was trying for a Spanish fly. At one point, and this is probably one of the highlights of the entire goddamn show, Jeff Cobb catches Shingo, and he does, I don't know if he does a German, he does a German suplex, or maybe he does a gut wrench, but after that, he puts him in a fallway slam position, and he does a standing moonsault while holding Shingo, basically almost like a standing Spanish fly, but in the position of a fallway slam, lands on Shingo, and I'm like, this 300-pounder just did a standing moonsault with a grown-ass man who's probably close to 270 in his hands. That is impressive. But the match kept going. It's like, I never wanted this match to end. Like, that's how great this match was. They just kept going and going and going. Shingo Takage did end up winning this match with the last of the dragon. I was I shouldn't have been shocked they lifted Jeff Cobb up, but he did. He got the big man up. He lasted a dragon and got the three count. Shingo Takagi winning this match easily. Match of the year contender. I would give this match. Oh, do I want to go ten out of ten? I want to go nine and a half. I'm gonna go nine and a half. I don't. I'm so I'm so in between today, guys. I don't know. I don't know, like, it was great, but 10 out of 10 I reserved for, like, the best matches. The best of the best. It was worthy match of the year. It is worth 100%. Drop everything and watch this match. Let me read, let me go do, let me go through my criteria. Did I enjoy this match? Absolutely. Would I put it over the last crop of matches that I watch? Absolutely. Did it meet expectations? It exceeded expectations. Would I watch it back again? Absolutely. See, right there, that's the criteria for a 9 out of 10. Now, to get to 10 out of 10, I gotta ask myself, do I think this is better than every match on night 1? So, going down the line, do I think it was better than every match <laughs> before uh, Okada and Osprey? Absolutely, it was. 
Do I think it was better than Okada and Osprey? I thought it was. The question is, do I think it was better than Tetsuya Naito and Kota Ibushi? Do I think this is better than Tetsuya Naito and Kota Ibushi? You know what? I think there was a certain exhilaration and a vibe to this match that Kota Ibushi and Naito, I think, lacked for at least part of it and i think for that alone i think i do have to go 10 out of that you know what fuck it this is a 10 out of 10 for me i didn't think i'd ever see the day that a never match gets a 10 out of 10 but here we are 10 out of 10 for shingo takage and jeff cobb they earned it but now the question is where do we go from here with the empire because not only did the great okan lose but will osprey lost and Jeff Cobb lost. So now your whole factions are losers. So, hmm. Do we exactly just break up the Empire now? I mean, you can't break them up. They just started. How do you repair them? Because there's obviously damage there now. Everybody lost. I was joking around saying they're buried. They're not buried necessarily, but they definitely are damaged now. How do we repair the Empire I think the answer is simple. I think they bounce back. They have to start winning. Like, they can't go into New Year Dash and New Beginning and start and lose as well. They need to win from here on out. Like, I know Wrestle Kingdom is the biggest show of the year, and it's a big loss from them, but they can easily start coming back by winning their matches. They cannot lose going forward. I'm not saying they need to go on an undefeated streak for the rest of the year. That's not what I'm saying. But they need to win for at least the next few months. No losses for the next few months. None at all, in my opinion. We then get into the co... No, we get into the semi-main event of the evening. Sonata versus... Evil. Alright, so... You guys, if you watch my Wrestle Kingdom live stream, you know that I fell asleep. I actually legitimately grabbed my pillow, grabbed my blanket, and I went to sleep during this match. I did not watch it. However, in order to properly review the show, I did have to watch this match. Highlights. <laughs> I found some match highlights on uh, Daily Motion, and I watched this match because I I'm sorry I was not watching this damn match. I'm, I just I had no interest. I had no interest. I watched the highlights. From the highlights I saw, it it seemed aggressively aggressively okay like i perceived that it had to have been at least better than the last match that they had because people were saying oh this is a a good match probably the best match i've seen i might have to go back and watch this match honestly i might have to but i couldn't do it guys i'm sorry i couldn't do it um dick togo from what i saw dick togo got involved a lot in this match and it ended up costing him so all this time, Dick Togo was thinking he was doing something right, and here he is fucking up. He got over, he got in his head too much, man. He got in his head too much, and he caused evil to match. Sonata won the match here. The Cold Skull Sleeper. Or was it the Moonsault? I don't even remember the finish of this match. Holy shit. Anyway, <laughs> Sonata wins this match. Like I said, from the highlights I saw, I thought it was aggressively okay. It could have been better, though. Could have been better than what I was leading on to be. But that was Okada. That was Sonata versus Evil. I'll leave it at that. We then get in to the co-main events of the evening. Taiji Ishimori versus Hiromu Takahashi for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Championship. Now, I believe Chris Samzel on Twitter said this is the highest positioned junior heavyweight match ever in the Tokyo Dome. So I'm happy for my boys. That they were, they were up on the card like that. This is their fourth match since Summer Struggle in August. So from August to September, September to November. Uh, no, uh, to, uh, August, September, October, November, December, January. So out of six months, this is the fourth match they had. I thought it was a great match that these guys had in here. I did not think it was better than the G128 match, however. I thought that that's almost a practically untouchable match. But it had the speed, the athleticism, the hard-hitting nature you expect from Hiromu Takahashi and Taiji Shimori to have. 
There was nothing, like, ad- absurdly dangerous that happened in this match. Like, uh, Hiromu and Osprey, where, like, Osprey basically foot-stomped Hiromu's neck. It was not even close. I, I don't think this match is even close to the level of Hiromu versus Osprey or Hiromu versus El Desperado. But I think in its own right, it was still great. Hiromu Takahashi did end up winning the match with the, with the Dynamite Plunger to become the new IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion. I would give this match an 8. I give it a solid 8 out of 10. I thought it was enjoyable. I really liked it. Like I said, I didn't think it was better than G128, but I think there's a lot to enjoy about this match. Then we get into the main event of the evening. Kota Ibushi defends his IWGP Intercontinental and Heavyweight Championship against Switchblade Jay White. This, ladies and gentlemen, was a phenomenal match. Phenomenal match. Now, my nitpick is that it was 48 minutes. This match was nearly an hour long, and it beat out the record for longest Tokyo Dome match, well, longest Wrestle Kingdom match of all time, which went to Kenny Omega versus Kazuchika Okada at Wrestle Kingdom 11 at 46 minutes. And I feel like, nah, I, this could not be the case, but I feel like this match went 48 minutes solely so they could beat that record. Like, there was no, there was no indicators leading into this match. And there was no reason for this match to have gone... Like, like, let's be honest. There was no reason for this match to have gone on 48 minutes. <laughs> no reason this match had to go that long. Now, now in the 48 minutes, we saw some compelling storytelling, some all-around great action, some tasteful limb targeting, some tasteful selling. The first 15, 20 minutes, it was, it was a little slow. I, it was never really... The Okada type slow pacing, like there's a different pacing when it comes to Okada, like Okada in Jay White matches. With Jay White matches, he knows how to target a limb and he knows exactly how to lead an opponent on, in a very interesting way, which keeps you appealed on him and makes you wanting his opponent to get out of it more than Okada does. And I think that's why there's more intrigue with Jay White matches. And I said it before going into this match. I don't know how a Jay White Tokyo Domain event looks like. I don't know what that looks like. But I was very I was very pleased with what we got. Once you hit that 20, 30 minute mark, Ibushi starts coming back. But really, 85% of this match was Jay White. Like literally this match was slowly Jay White picking apart Ibushi's shoulder, Ibushi's head, Ibushi's neck, Ibushi's legs. I do think it was a little and I don't even want to say ridiculous. It was a little like uh, well, how do I phrase this? A little non-linear that Jay White kind of targeted like multiple body parts. Now you could perceive this in two different ways. You can say it was smart for him to target like multiple body parts, or it was a little bit distracting. I would say that I would have rather him stuck to maybe two, but he targeted like the neck, the shoulder, and the legs. Mostly the legs because the JTO was a submission that he used to tap out Tanahashi. Which he used in his match like three different times. Which by the third time I'm like, okay, we get it. <laughs> like, like we get it, bro. You you you're be targeting the leg. And Ibushi, obviously, he bounced back. He was going at him. People were had to nitpick. Abushi's not selling the leg. He's not selling the leg. And I will give you guys this. Towards the end, Abushi did forget to sell. But what are you gonna do after 48 minutes? Is he not going to hit the Kamaguye? Is he not going to hit the V-Trigger? Is he not going to do the Phoenix Splash? Ibushi's moveset is mainly legs. The Phoenix Splash, that's core body, but he's using his legs. Kamaguye, legs. Gunnistar Powerbomb, legs. Ibushi was going to win this match. He needed to use his legs to win the match. Which is why, when he hit the Kamaguye, the, what was it, the second or third time? He didn't go for the media pin. And that cost him. And Jay White put his leg on the rope. So, there's a selling right there. Jay White tried many times for the split for the Blade Runner. And Kodobushi kept on countering and countering. 
and Kamaguye counters. It was it was counter city by the time you got to the 35 40 minute mark. Jay White finally hits the blade. Now here's another thing that wasn't a nitpick. I actually kind of liked it. Is that these guys were stretching out and they were really holding out on using their finishers, like to the point where you almost believe that when they hit their finisher, it's over. I said as much on the stream. It's been 30 minutes and I have not seen a single finisher. When they hit it, it's likely over. Jay White's Blade Runner is one of the most protective finishers in all of pro wrestling. Nobody has ever kicked out of it to this point. The Kamaguye was fairly protected up until night one where Jay White, Naito kicked out twice, but no one's ever kicked out of the Blade Runner. So when Jay White hit the Blade Runner, I ain't gonna lie, I shot, I, I shot myself a little bit. I was like, what well, is this over? <laughs> this is it. This is it. He goes for the pin, and Ibushi kicks out. Kota Ibushi becomes the very first person to ever kick out of the Blade Runner. And Jay White's kind of freaking out, not trying to spaz out, but he, you can tell in his face he's freaking out. He, he doesn't know what to do, but he knows he has to go into he has to go in the ozone later, in the ozone layer. So he's hitting his half Nelsons, he's hitting his Regal Plexes. Ibushi keeps kicking out and kicking out. The Fighting Spirit is channeling. He's he's doing the uh, Super Saiyan spots. It's a bit early in the match, but he's doing a Super Saiyan being Jay White's ass. But Jay White is still hanging in there. A ghetto interferences. They weren't as prevalent in this match. He wasn't interfering the entire time. They spaced them out. They spaced them out and it worked. Because when he hit that second, I think Kamaguye, and he went for the pin. I think no, 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 no. It was the I think it was like the third Kamaguye, and he went for the pin. I thought it was over. But the referee got yanked. He got yagged out of the ring by Ghetto. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding? I was, I was pissed when the referee got yanked out of the ring. And he gets into the ring and he tries to attack Abushi and Abushi fights him off. JY hits a low blow and I'm like, well, this is it. <laughs> this is it. But Abushi, he's hanging on. He's still hanging in there. Um, now, Ghetto's down at this point. You're expecting somebody from Bullet Club's coming out. I don't know who it's going to be, but maybe Evil, Evil Lost. Somebody's coming out to help Jay White. But nobody ever comes out to help him. And eventually, Kota Bushi hits a high knee onto Jay White. Hits a Kamaguye to the back of Jay White's head. And then finally pulls the knee pad down. And hits a final Kamaguye onto Jay White for the three count to retain. Retain! The IWGP Intercontinental and heavyweight championship it was a beautiful match it was a beautiful moment the end of the match where you see jay white he's still like with like no breath no semblance of where he is he's still trying to grab and fight abushi and the referee's like no it's over jay it's over and you know it's almost like jay's like it's not over it's not over and he doesn't say it but you can see on his face it's like it's not over it's not over and there's this one shot that New Japan is just so awesome at cinematography and videography. They're so awesome at this. They have the shot. You see, you have the IWGP championships in the foreground. You see Jay White is in, like, you know, he's in the back. And he's crawling. And he's grabbing the IWGP heavyweight championship. He grabs that first. And he starts pulling it towards him. And you can see Red Shoes comes in and he takes the title and JY murmurs something. I didn't hear what he murmured. But then the camera shot cuts over to Ibushi. And Ibushi kind of like smiles. He doesn't smile at JY, but he's like smiling and laughing. Like, oh, I won. I can't believe it. And then it cuts back to JY. And JY is grabbing the IC title. And then a referee takes away from him. And as referees take away from him, JY is like, no, no, no. Like, JY is almost slowly but surely freaking out that he lost this match. And JY basically has to get pulled out of the ring. To leave the ring, to leave the match, it was it was like beautiful storytelling, beautiful storytelling. Kodabushi, he stands tall as the sole champion of the night. A little bit after this, fucking Sonata comes out. Nobody asked him to come out, but he did. He comes out, he gets into the ring, looking kind of dapper. Not gonna lie, he gets into the ring and he challenges Kodabushi. Abushi accepts. So I guess that's official for New Beginning in Osaka by next month, if that happens, because New Japan might be shutting down soon. If I'm, if what I'm hearing is correct, they might be shutting down soon again, but we'll see. So Sonata comes out, challenges Ibushi. 
And that was Wrestle Kingdom night night two. I thought that I thought this was a great show. I thought this was a great show. I would give this show a nine out of ten. Jay White at Bushi was amazing. Taiji Shimori and Hiromu Takahashi was great. Jeff Cobb and Shingo was amazing as well. Kani Maru and Despi versus Master on Ryusuke Taguchi was really good. Sonata and Evil, yeah, I didn't watch it, so I didn't really care that much for it. The only the only dud on the show was Toriano, Balak Fale, Bushi, and Jace Owens. Outside of that, you take that match out of the equation, this is a great show. So, 9 out of 10 for me for this show. Uh, post-match interview with Jay White. I recommend you all go watch it. If you're listening to this on Patreon, there's a video up on Patreon where I did a live reaction to Jay White's interview. Where the guy basically, he, he breaks that da- Jay White breaks down. He literally breaks down. He's crying. He's not, he's not like inconsolably crying, but you know, he's teary eyed. He's saying everything I've ever worked hard for. I, I risked my fair, not my family. I risked family time. I, I moved away. I did this. I did that. And all that for nothing. And you people stand here and you, you, you're not supporting me. And, Jay White, I don't want to say he's playing the victim, but you feel kind of bad for Jay White. Because it's like, even though he's the villain, you see the pain in his eyes. He truly believed this was his time. And you saw the work he put in, whether it be uh, nefarious means of the work he put in. You saw the work he put into it. You knew he means what he says when he says he sacrificed so much to get to this point. And he doesn't realize his destiny. He says Destino, which I think is a good, a good, uh, a good little nod there. But he doesn't realize his Destino, and he laughs. It's almost like the Joker. It's almost like the Joker, kind of going sinister, kind of going psychotic. And at the end of his promo, he's saying that if New Japan was willing to have me, I'll be there on New Year's Dash. But after that, I think I'm done. And Jay White basically says that, hey. After this show, I'm done. That's what Jay White says. New Japan's typing it up as Jay White. Did Jay White quit? And this is how I know it's a work. New Japan is typing it up as if Jay White quit the company. Like, come on now. If the company is is blowing it up in that matter, it is obviously not. It's obviously not real. Jay White's not leaving the company. And if he is, I'm gonna be shocked. I will be truly shocked that Jay White leaves New Japan. But We'll talk about that. I'm getting a question is asked that a bit later on. We'll get to that in a second. That was Wrestle Kingdom 15, night one and two. I thought the better night was night two. Out of the Wrestle Kingdoms I've seen, this wasn't the best, but I enjoyed the show overall. And that's all I'm going to say about Wrestle Kingdom. So, it is 2021 after all. It is a new year. It is a new a new time for professional wrestling. January is my favorite month of the year for professional wrestling. All the new companies, all these companies put their best foot forward. And I have my predictions for 2021. For a lot of companies, mainly the companies I watch. But here are my predictions for professional wrestling this year. I'll reflect back on it at the very end of the year. But here we go. I predict that Goldberg... Will defeat Drew McIntyre to become the new WWE Champion? This is not a prediction that I want to make. This is not a prediction that I like to make. But sadly, it's one that I think will happen. Goldberg recently challenged Drew McIntyre on the latest episode of Monday Night Raw to a WWE Championship match at the Royal Rumble. So, uh, wasn't this feud between Goldberg and Roman Reigns? How is he interjecting the feud with Drew McIntyre? If the track record is anything to go off of, Goldberg literally beats every guy he goes in front of that's not named Brock Lesnar. Like, uh, or Braun Strowman at WrestleMania. He's beaten Dolph Ziggler, which is nothing. He's beaten Brock Lesnar. He's beaten, um, what's his name? I forget his name. He's beaten Kevin Owens. He's beaten The Undertaker didn't. He, he, he lost in The Undertaker. He didn't beat The Undertaker. Goldberg has basically beaten everybody of a big name in the WWE that was put in front of him. Here we have Drew McIntyre. Who is the guy in WWE right now? 
you would think they would have Drew McIntyre go over Goldberg and really get him over. But then you look at last year when Goldberg faced The Fiend and everybody thought that The Fiend was going to beat him and Goldberg beat him. So we're nearing WrestleMania and all of these rumors are circulating that, oh, Goldberg versus Roman Reigns. Now the real big question I have is, how are you getting from point A to point B if Roman Reigns is the Universal Champion and Goldberg is the WWE Champion? How do you get from point A to point B exactly? Not too sure on that one, but we'll talk about that in another episode. Continue on. I predict that either The Fiend or Sheamus will win the men's Royal Rumble match. And I predict that Bianca Belair will win the women's Royal Rumble match and challenge Sasha Banks at WrestleMania. I predict that WrestleMania 37 will emanate from Tropicana Field Stadium in St. Petersburg, Florida at 10% capacity. So, I believe that 4,000 people will attend WrestleMania 37. 4,000 people only, spread out. If not, oh well. I predict that Raw's ratings will dip as low as 1.3 million viewers. I predict that Pete Dunne, Kyle O'Reilly, Cameron Grimes will all become NXT North American Champion by the end of the year, in no particular order. I predict that Mercedes Martinez, Rhea Ripley, and Candice LeRae will all become NXT Women's Champion by the end of the year, no particular order. I predict that Karrion Cross will be once again become NXT Champion, and I also predict that Damian Priest, will, at one point this year, will become NXT Champion. I predict... That NXT will peak this year at 990,000 views. But they will not hit 1 million. I predict that at some point this year, AEW will peak at 1.2 million viewers. I don't know what that will be, but 1.2 is my uh, predicted peak for them. I predict that Kenny Omega at some point this year will in fact become Impact Wrestling World Champion. And will, in fact, hold that title for a few months before dropping it to, I don't know who, probably like Sammy Cowan or somebody like that. I predict that Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa, in no particular order, will be AEW Women's Champion at some point this year. I predict that Alex Reynolds and John Silver will become AEW Tag Team Champions at some point this year. I predict that Cody, Eddie Kingston, Orange Cassidy, and Sting... At some point this year, will become AEW TNT Champion. And I predict that Hangman Page and MJF, in no particular order, will become AEW World Champion at some point this year. I also believe that Tom Nakano, Konami, and Jungle Kiona, at some point this year, in no particular order, will become Wonder of Stardom Champion. I believe that Julia at some point this year, will become the World of Stardom Champion. Getting into some New Japan. To round that off. I believe that Will Ospreay or Kazuchika Okada will win New Japan Cup and challenge Kota Bushi for both the IWGP Heavyweight and IC Championship at Sakura Genesis, where either man will lose. I predict that John Moxley will not return back to Japan until middle of the year. To defend the IWGP US Championship against Kenta. Where he will retain against Kenta. Because LOL New Japan. I predict that Evil will regain the IWGP Intercontinental and Heavyweight Championship at Dominion. I predict that Jay White will in fact win G1 Climax 31. And I predict that... The IWGP Heavyweight and Intercontinental Championships will not separate until Okada becomes the double champion. Which may happen this year, but I'm not predicting that he will be champion this year. I won't doubt it though. I won't doubt it though. And lastly, I predict that AEW and New Japan Pro Wrestling will not be partnered by year's end. But will continue to have working relationships with other companies. And that is my predictions for 2021. Not gonna lie, the last one I hope is wrong. But <laughs> let's get into some of your questions. I asked you guys during my Wrestle Kingdom live stream, what should we talk about on the Chopo podcast? And you guys answered. Griff asks, so when are we getting Abushi versus Omega? LOL. 
Never. That dude asks, do you think Despy will win the Junior Heavyweight or BOSJ in the near future? Junior Heavyweight Championship or BOSJ? Uh, sadly, I don't think so. Like, if you watch New Japan enough, you can tell what guys are cemented in what role. Despy is cemented in, like, the Junior Tag role. Like, I don't, I don't see where he ever becomes a Junior Heavyweight Champion. Would I like him to? Absolutely, because Despy is amazingly talented. But I don't see where that happens. I don't see what year that happens. How old is El Desperado? How old is he? Hold on. El Desperado. Despy is 37. He's like almost the same age as Kota Ibushi. He's 37 years old. He's not getting any younger. He could be the junior boy champion one day. I, I just don't see it happening. I would like it to, but I don't see it happening. Um, That dude asks... Do you think, how long do you think Ibushi's reign will last until Dominion? That dude also asks, do you think a New Japan and AEW relationship will happen sometime this year? No. <laughs> I, I wanted to, but I don't think so. And NJPW Fin 10 asks, if Jay White did not, didn't win, which he didn't, will he be kicked out of the Bullet Club? His contract is up soon. He has a home in Florida. Will he go to AEW or NXT? I'll combine that with Riff's question, which is, what's next for Jay White? Do I think Jay will get kicked out? <clears throat> ah, so so fast. I speak so fast sometimes. So let me grab some water. I haven't drink some water at all during this uh, podcast here. Ah, there we go. So, will Jay White get kicked out of the Bullet Club? There is a great chance he will get kicked out of the Bullet Club. I don't know when. I don't know when, but there is a great chance it will happen. I am going to say that he will get kicked out of the Bullet Club at some point this year. I don't I don't know if it happens at New Year Dash. Which, if you're listening to this, it, it may have already happened at New Year Dash. I'm going to say it doesn't have a New Year Dash. I'm going to say he doesn't show up at New Year Dash. His contract is up soon. Does he go to AEW NXT? I think he's staying in Japan. I think he... I, I, now, I can tell you right now, after that match, definitely I could see Triple H or Tony Khan gunning for Jay White. I don't see Jay White going to either company, though. I think he's staying in Japan. He's a homegrown New Japan talent. Normally, homegrown Japanese talent don't tend to walk out and leave. I'm not saying it can't happen. But I can't see Jay White in AEW. Like, that that does not compute. Like, I'm like a robot. Does not compute. Does not compute. I, I don't... I don't see that. NXT? I don't see that. Like, Jay White doesn't even fit the NXT mold. Like, I don't think American fans are going to understand Jay White. The Smarky fans will. But the casual NXT fans, they're not going to understand Jay White. They're not going to They're not gonna get the wrestler Jay White. They're gonna they're gonna boo this guy for the wrong reasons. So no. I'm gonna say he stays in New Japan. As far as what's next for him, I kinda said it already in my reaction video to the Jay White interview, but I'll say it here. I think Jay White directionally is going babyface, but I don't think character wise he should change all too much. Now there should be a shift in character. I do think in some way he has to adapt and change creatively. However, I would not have him come out smiling. I would not have him come out, you know, joining chaos. None of that shit. I think he should still keep that heelist type vibe to him while at the same time going after both heels and baby faces. Similar to Sting in WCW. Uh, as far as where does he go from there, I think that Jay White likely wins G1 Climax with either Evil as the champion or Okada as the champion. And Jay White wins both titles at Wrestle Kingdom next year. I think right here, right now, Wrestle Kingdom this year has already propositioned Jay White to be in the main event of next year's Wrestle Kingdom. He is almost guaranteed to win G1 Climax this year. I'll be shocked if he doesn't. He already got the contract from Bushi this year, but it was by cheating. I think it's a great story to tell of him winning the G1 Climax contract this year without cheating. And then, if you want to spice things up, you can have him face Ibushi for the contract at Power Struggle. 
this year. That's what I would do with Jay White. I could I could stand here all day and spend more time mapping it out, but near death is approaching. I might even do an exclusive Patreon review for New Year Dash. Since, well, after all, New Year Dash is going to be the day after I do this review. Who knows? But, guys, that was Chill Pill Podcast, episode 28. What did you guys think? Comment down below. Let your boy know. That was Wrestle Kingdom 15. Comment down below what you guys thought about that show. I love you guys as always. I will see you all later. I got a trip to go on, guys. I'm ready for this trip to Costa Rica. I've been, I've been, whew. Let me head up out of here. Love you guys as always. I will see you all next Wednesday. Peace out, guys.